Hello and welcome to this webcast in the History and Context of Journalism series at the University of Winchester. Today's subject is modernism and we are going to look at, to look at it through the work of James Joyce. James Joyce was an Irish writer and poet born in 1822 in Dublin. He came from a modest background since his father was a terrible businessman. Joyce's parents wanted their son to enter priesthood, but the author rejected religion in his teenage years. Joyce studied French, English and Italian at university and in 1902 he attempted to study medicine in Paris but quickly gave up because he couldn't understand French. He went back to Dublin but soon after his mother's death he moved to Trieste. During these years Joyce taught English, wrote The Blainers, which is a collection of 15 short stories about the Irish middle class life. He never moved back to Ireland and died in Zurich in 1941. His novel Ulysses, published in 1922, create, created a storm and was banned until recently. I have with me in the studio Andy Giddings, David Champion, Sebastian Ferris and Carol Laithway. Andy, can you tell me more about Ulysses? Well, it was published um, in the early 20th century um, when the modernist movement was really beginning to pick up pace. And the special thing about the book is it really does uh, exemplify uh, the the modernist ethos, if you like, of, of shaking off any kind of restrictions um, that were created by um, old rules or um, religion or, or anything like that. So the book itself, it reads quite disjointed. Um, the plot thread isn't as clear as, it, as it you'd normally expect from a book. Um, the chapters kind of run into one another. There are hundreds of different characters. So what makes the book so special is it's a very freely written it was just written as, as the guy, as, um, as James Joyce may have wanted to speak it, um, and just written as, as thoughts came into his head. Um, and that's, that's why it's such a good example of, of modernism. Right. Uh, Sebastian, can you give more details about that? How, how is it written in a free way, as Andy said, freely way? Well, as Andrew said, it's, um, it's quite irreverent. It um, moves away from traditional styles of writing. It's, um, it's, as you would call in literary terms, it's avant-garde. So it, it basically it just kind of adopts its own um, approach to talking about the subject. It, uh, it, it, focuses, it focuses on things through the, um, kind of through the eyes of um, the character, um, Leopold Bloom. And it's, it kind of it grasps it from a... Um, it's quite sporadic. Things happen as they would through the human conscience. Um, but also it touches on how things are affected by the unconscious, which is, um, as uh, Freud focused on, is a very significant part of um, human thought processes. But as far as the book is actually um, concerned, it, it tends to ramble, which is um, how thoughts actually um, occur in the brain. So it, it, it's quite a realistic approach. Thank you, Seb. Um, David, can you tell me... Actually, what is the story in this book? Uh, it's the it's written to follow one day of a a man called Bloom in Dublin, and it's uh it's written in a manner which includes the most mundane details, the most vulgar sometimes bodily functions, every little detail, and that's done to achieve a sense of realism which most books don't usually touch on. It goes into much more detail than is usually needed in a story just to tell a story. So uh, there's a lot of his thoughts involved, as Sebastian and Andy have already said. A lot of it's very dreamlike, so it can be a very hard storyline to follow. It rambles, it changes, and it's a lot of the things are subconscious things, and uh, many times you don't know whose hallucinations you are reading, which character is having a hallucination. And many people have actually said the book has its own subconscious. It's not necessarily the subconscious of a character or the experiences of a character, it's the things the book has experienced. So many things will come up in a hallucination, for example, that haven't actually happened in the book or to a character, but it's something merely that the book has touched upon and something that's been picked up during the day. As, as Sebastian said, um, he used the word avant-garde, which comes from, um, I believe, advanced guard. It was about the first soldiers into battle. It's about breaking new ground and going somewhere that 
nobody has been before. So it dealt with new issues. Um, it was deemed obscene at the time, and a lot of people would still probably find it to be obscene now. Um, there are um, elements of d denial of religion, um, the forsaking of God. So uh, it was it was a big it was a big risk, if you like. I mean, it was banned. It was banned initially, and that was a result of. Of breaking the rules you know things things get banned because they break rules so and, and that sort of goes back to what I was saying before mm. it's modernist it's about not sticking to established conventions it's about trying new things which some people can find offensive mm. thank you Andy and also during the seminar we concentrated on chapter 15 Circe um, Seb would you mind uh, outline some of the issues in this chapter um, well basically it's um it focuses quite heavily on the um, the uh, unconscious, um, as I referred to earlier, which is um, one of Freud's um, favourite subjects. It um, it taps into the kind of the nether reaches of the brain, which um, you know, as Andrew said, a lot of people weren't um, quite ready to uh, be dealing with. They saw these things as um, obscene, as uh, repugnant they just they just didn't want to be hearing about it didn't want to be reading about it as uh, reading is more um, often more influential than um, hearing you get to kind of judge it for yourself um, it it basically it, it, it kind of influences you in a way it makes you think of um, the things that um, most make people tick and um, one thing that I took um, <coughs> from this particular chapter was the uh, the significance of guilt, the um, the trips, these hallucinations that um, Bloom he kind of undergoes throughout the chapter, are um, uh, influenced quite heavily by things that he um, has intense guilt about, such as um, I don't know, possibly betraying his um, parents. He's um, in the part of the book he hallucinates about being um, reprimanded by them. He uh, he is um, sexually tortured by um, a woman, uh, a madam of a brothel, and he, um, he, he, seems to, he seems to want to punish himself for these things that he has um, done in the past and is willing to repent, as he is actually told by his um, mother um, towards the end of the chapter. So it's, uh, it's basically sort of uh, tapping into quite a Freudian aspect of the mind, the, um, the id, the ego, the superego, and uh, it really brings that to the um, the forefront of um, this type of modernist literature. Thank you, Seb. Um, Andy, uh, can you define uh, subconscious uh, against Enlightenment rationality? Well, um, subconscious was um, is was or is uh, a Freudian idea. Freud was a, another modernist who broke new ground in his his study of the mind. Um, a lot of what he said, has since been kind of scientifically debunked, but is still um, considered to be fact by a lot of people. Freud believed that um, your conscious mind only makes up a small percentage of who you are. So you, the, the thoughts that you have, your, your cognitive thinking, the way you understand things, are only a minute part of you. And underneath that, you just have this vast, um, vast bank of memories and experiences right from birth which influence who you've become. What, in, in this chapter um, that we're talking about, chapter 15, um, what Joyce explored was this idea. So uh, the main character becomes intoxicated and starts having these hallucina hallucinations, but a lot of the um, imagery in it is, is very sexual, um, or it's about um, parentage and that kind of thing. So it's, it's bringing to the front what would normally lie underneath, and that's what this chapter did, and, and this is where a lot of offence came to people. So that, that this is the idea of subconscious, that when you strip away all of your, um, your, your kind of sensibilities, if you like, and, and your inhibitions, you're just left with this kind of seething mass of, of sexuality and rage and, and very basic, basic um, ideas which um, would bring us closer to animals than we'd like to think. Thank you, Andy. Um, also, in this chapter and in the entire book, the representation of women is very complex. 
Um, David, would you mind outline some of these ideas? Uh, yeah, the idea of women in this chapter is quite important. It's quite an important point to take from the entire chapter because from a, from a basic point of view, it seems that women are taking a quite insignificant role. They're prostitutes in a brothel, and it seems it's all, all the narrations from a man's point of view. It's all their hallucinations, and that's the first thing that strikes a person when they read it from a, a first-glance point of view. But when they look into it a bit closer, they see that women are actually a very key theme to it. The end of, the, of chapter 15 is a, a prostitute called Molly having uh, some form of hallucination or deep thought, and she actually says that she chooses Bloom, which is quite a turnaround for the whole chapter because it's actually a change in roles, and it seems to... It goes in, in a... It works with the ideas of feminism because it's saying that she has chosen him, she's the empowered woman, and it makes all of Bloom's drunken hallucinations, crazy little things he's done throughout the whole chapter seem a bit insignificant because... It wraps up saying that she has the power. She's the one who's chosen him. She's the empowered woman. And this works with feminism and national uh, modernism, many of the ideas against nationalism, which were rife at the time. And there's another, another part of women as well, is his mother. The ghost of his mother rises up through the floor in chapter 15, and uh, she's asking him to repent. She's saying, repent, repent, repent. And he says... I will not repent or I will not follow something along those lines and it's it goes with the Nietzsche's ideas of fighting nationalism fighting religion fighting all mass movements and it was the idea of the ubermensch becoming the ultimate man a man that's self-sufficient doesn't follow doesn't follow the herd such you know Christianity says calls followers the herd and the shepherd leaders the shepherd and this is very Nietzschean ideas that and modernism as a whole that people should not follow these mass movements should not be part of the herd of christianity or any religion and this this is made clear by his mother with the whole her asking him to repent and him rejecting it it's an attack on christianity and there's also attacks on nationalism throughout the throughout the whole chapter he actually his friend actually ends up getting knocked out by a british soldier because he's attacking the occupation of Ireland. Thank you, David. Uh, you've mentioned uh, Nietzsche. Seb, uh, would you mind telling me uh, how Nietzsche is relevant to this novel? Well, um, Nietzsche uh, came about at a time where um, modernism was, um, was a pioneering force in um, a lot of philosophical thought. Um, Joyce... His book, um, Ulysses, it relates to um, Nietzsche's ideas about um, overcoming um, old old world ideas, old world um, orders. I mean, in its um, in its style alone, it is comp completely breaking the mold. Uh, but also um, in its themes of um, of uh, of tracking the human mind and tracking it from a perspective that is purely human. It's uh, it's completely irreverent. He um, Joyce himself, he uh, broke away from Christianity despite being um, educated primarily by um, by monks. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's actually um, something that links in quite nicely with uh, between uh, Nietzsche and um, Joyce, with uh, which is the um, the famous uh, phrase "God is dead." <laughs> 